Thank you very much. So Neil, um, fascinating conversation in terms of innovation. Um, I just wanted to ask you who you thought should be leading the drive in pushing innovation in the industry. Should it be the policymakers? Should it be the uh, the uh, regulators? Should it be client organizations? Should it be the tech providers? Who do you think is the best uh, positioned to drive innovation in the best way possible? Shall I give you the lazy answer? No. All of the above. <laughs> However, I think the traditional school of thought is it has to come top down. So it's the clients, but I think we've been sitting waiting for that to happen for a while now. So I'd, I'd still say the it's a mixture of the top down and the bottom up and everybody has a role to play. So I don't think there's an excuse anymore that if you're sitting at the bottom of the supply chain that you should sit still and do nothing. There's, there's a lot of good in doing innovation for your own good and do it for your own good. But also, I think there's a lot of work to be done. I think on one of my slides, it was about business to business, business to client. Mm. And I think there's a role for partnership, more role within the supply chain if you're a, a tier one <clears throat> to be working with your client, inspiring your client, demonstrating to your client the value of new technology and new ways of working so that you can then work together and collaborate together to do it. So. Sorry, that's a very short and succinct answer, but I think it's everybody. I don't think anybody should take it as an excuse that it's somebody else's responsibility because I think there's been a certain amount of that going on. And I think this this group of presenters as well is is very uh, pro innovation. If I if I speak for you, we're, we've got a very good range of conversations happening already this morning. Um, so if anyone else wants to come in on that, who do you think should be the the prime position to innovate? Um, in a <laughs> not policymakers and not regulators. And that's where we all wait. You will wait forever for the HSE to give you anything. And that's not because they're not willing, it's because the volume of data that they get, and it still is data, it's not wisdom for them. Wisdom is about the application of knowledge. That's very clearly came out. And the people who can do that, and we see it a lot, I have a whole bunch of scientists who swarm around data every day Converting that into action is the key. So it's the person on the ground. Get on with it. Mm. If you have inaction, you have nothing. If you do something, you will prompt a reaction. That will therefore mean stuff, smooth, stuff moves forward. So from our perspective, as an independent, impartial, science-driven organization, don't wait for the people who've got the data. Use the data to get stuff done and do it on the ground. Fabulous, thank you. Uh, Steve, I just wanted to ask you about your project. Thank you very much for introducing us to all things 5G. And I think it's a wonderful opportunity to really connect, especially with the, the move towards uh, Internet of Things and digital twins. And the, the topic of conversation yesterday was very much about that national approach to digital twins. But what's next post phase four? Uh, no, really good question. Thank you, Victoria. So we're not going to stop when we've uh, finished phase four. And I think uh, where we go next is uh, is probably going to be uh, from from the feedback that we get from the previous phases. So uh, and it'd be really good if we can uh, have a spin off something a bit like what what Tony's done with the uh, commit to drones. So so I'm hopeful for for something like that. But uh, certainly we will be continuing and and, and looking at how we can uh, uh, explore. And, uh, and, and get more out of 5G. Thanks. And Stuart, as a co-leader on that, on that project, is there anything else you wanted to add on that perspective? Uh, no. Um, I think, um, to be fair to Steve, he, he's, he's led the project quite well. We could do with a few more participants, <laughs> a few members in it. Um, yeah, so I, I know there's a few people in the audience potentially could get involved in it. Let's speak. Let's see if we can develop it and get, get, you, get you on board. Because... Uh, as Steve said, you know, collectively we've got the answers, but singly we haven't. So let's have a few more people. Okay. Andy, Nathan and Paul, you spoke about um, project safety, and I think that was a, a fascinating insight, looking at the type of progression that we can make through technology and te technical advances. But I wanted to ask you about um, data capture and inadvertent data, data capture in, in terms of the, the wearable tech and the IoT sensors and things. Is that an issue, do you think, as an industry, we need to be more aware about what kind of data we are capturing to do with personal data and ethical uh, data protection? And how best can we protect ourselves from that perspective? Um, yes, it's, it's certainly an issue. <laughs> I think, as we all know, the, the more data 
that, that we collect it's not just understanding it but it's actually controlling it as well and understanding where it goes and, and what it's used for um, we look at that a lot and we have ended up and it would be interesting to get everyone else's opinion actually we've ended up really looking at it from the bottom up and thinking well our end users is is that worker on the ground they're the ones that with us they're giving us like exceptionally personal data where we're kind of reading what's going on inside their heads um so it's vital for them to feel that they have complete control over that data uh, so we are have that in our terms and conditions when they first sign up, they have complete control over their personal data and they have the ability with, to withdraw it at, at any point as well. Uh, then as soon as it goes up into the cloud, it's it's anonymized up there. So that's uh, how FC Labs are dealing with it. Um, but then we also understand when we're looking globally, there's many challenges. There's different laws in every other uh, and in the US is different laws in every state isn't there that you need, need to deal with um, so that is re really asking the experts in those countries uh, what to do with, with the data uh, anybody else want to well, I was just going to use it in, in, in our example uh, because we're trying to manage noise so yeah you can stick things in your ears to try and lessen the amount of noise that goes in that's what we've been doing for years but by using data we're now able to do put dose meters same analogy as a little radioactive dose meter, you get the idea of how much the worker is being exposed to. This has a huge benefit from the, from the employer's point of view, because this is a way in which they can actually capture individuals' exposure to that safety, that, that, that safety issue, noise in our case, so it enables them to uh, ensure that they're managing up to the compliance level. Um, then it also allows you to then start to better manage the situation for the, from the, from the uh, wearer's point of view because you can give them alert to say the hearing protection you've got in at the moment is not adequate for the, the, the amount of noise you're being exposed to. So either you've got five minutes in that noise or you need to get out uh, or you need to do something else, which is in our case double up and put, put muffs on or do something about it. So capturing the right amount of data at the point in where it's occurring is absolutely paramount for delivering a better solution. Um, then how obviously you can integrate that data and aggregate it across the worker's lifetime um, is, is all part of it. Um, and I very much hope that our clients are conforming to uh, strict EU laws um, and looking after that individual's data. But from our point of view, we're looking at aggregating it to deliver a better solution. In terms of process, so as a, again, as a research body, this is where we learn from other sectors. Day in, day out, this is what my lot do. They manage personal data. We have tons and tons of data of, from across loads of organizations like the NHS that we manage on a regular basis. So don't reinvent the wheel. There are already great ways of managing personal data. It's just finding those examples and then using them well. I just add to that. It's, it's around um, not just regulation, but I remember one project when we were trying to track where people were for health and safety reasons within tunnels, and there was good reasons for doing it. Um, was the unionised objection to that in terms of what, why you're doing it? You know, there must be some sinister reason why you're capturing our data. But I think Andy, you made the point that if you engage the users early and for a long time and explain to them and, and take the time to explain to them why. It's for their safety, it's for their benefit, and that their data is safe. I think there's a lesson in user acceptance there, which, which I just wanted to pick up on, though, which is really important not to forget. Thank you. A nice segue into, uh, into Jordan. There's a question I wanted to ask about um, considering future use cases, and we're talking about uh, connected data, integrated data, but bringing in the, the future of connected autonomous plant, vehicles, uh, resource people, uh, how best can, uh, as an industry, prepare itself for that positive t change and really have that, that full integration? Uh, I guess I would say it's, you know, a lot of uh, tech platforms out there kind of closed platforms and it's really hard to get information in, in, in and out and uh, you continue to run into uh, from the plants perspective you know we've as an eight they've continued to integrate with various um, on-site tools softwares and things like that so uh, software companies have to understand that they need that data because capturing the data comes from a variety of sources people equipment and AI and all these things. So as the, I guess, as the industry continues to advance and bring more uh, tools, platforms, connected platforms like Innate, like your Procore's different softwares need to 
um, have that open API system and, and enable um, touch points to bring it in, I guess I would say. Hopefully that makes sense. I did, thank you. Um, and Tom, from a from a net zero perspective, logistics is one of the big contributors towards uh, uh, carbon footprints and the climate change, especially across construction. So um, thinking about uh, pushing towards a more sustainable future and uh, building on what, what Jordan's just said in terms of the, the data capture and the, the connected aspect of it. Uh, what was, would be the biggest barrier to entry and what would be the best solution in terms of data, uh, data enabled, digitally enabled, sustainable futures? So I suppose, um, I mean, we're looking at this with our telematics point of view to make utilization of machines on sites more efficient. And it would be the same with um, making smarter choices on, on your delivery, how, you, how you're moving machines around, how you're going to put those products where they are. I suppose that comes from our data, from what the, what the, what the tier ones are doing with their data, how, how they're moving that around, making sure you're not just moving machines around for the sheer hell of it. Or it, would it be more beneficial to leave a machine that may remain unutilized, yeah. but however, the cost of, and I suppose really you have to look at the cost of the carbon footprint on that. Although you may be able to make a couple hundred quid for an extra couple of days higher, but at what cost is that at? And if you have to be accountable for what the cost of the CO2 is, then potentially you leave the machine or the product there. Um, but again, that's not going to float with everyone because obviously mm -hmm. there's money involved and, and if, if people can make more money, they want to. But I suppose either there has to be recompense or reward for this. So. Um, yeah, just add one more thing. I was sitting here thinking about, you know, better collaboration with all of the kind of startup companies and that, that have the equipment and the, the site, um, you know, equipment, that sort of stuff to really understand and make sure that file formats and output of data is going to map because so many people like, for example, one thing Innate did is we went out and bought a platform and years later we're trying to integrate it and realized, oh my gosh, this is not mar marrying up. So. I think tech companies and these innovation conferences is a really good place to continue for um, project management platforms that are absorbing that data to collaborate with all of the tech companies that are providing it and ensuring that there's um, alignment for, for data sources and, and the types of data that's going to be coming in so that it's accepted. Absolutely. It needs to be a whole life approach as well. It's not just single phase. I think as an industry, we're, we're very good at throwing things over the fence, no matter whether it's from strategy into construction or construction into operations. I think as a, as a community, we need to be respectful of each other's perspectives and, and be more collaborative from that perspective. So before I open it up to the floor, I'm going to just hand it quickly to Stuart. Have you got any questions? I want to, um, Tom, Tom uh, took us around the factory, so to speak. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you was, I know that you, um, you're very much into um, lean within the factory. Um, you, <clears throat> you showed some robotics. Have you got any plans to go further with that to take it from, is it semi-automated to fully automated? Or is there, is there a point where you say, no, we've done enough? No, I suppose for, for, for our point of view, no, nothing's ever enough. Um, I know there is plans, but I can't talk too much about them for a next stage of going, let's say, mid-semi to fully automated. Um, we aren't the automotive industry. We can't have robots built, bolting these machines together. They're too big, too heavy. Um, we are looking at changing out floors for um, automated floors that can move the machines up instead of having to use other sources. But also, we're, we're looking at what's available uh, financially and with the, time, uh, the technology at the time. So one of our next thing is to go through um, sub-mechanical assemblies to automate them to a degree. Uh, but I believe that at the moment that requires a, either a very big extension or a new factory. So I think that's with our planners and our local council to if they let us have some more land in Milton Keynes. I've got one more question. This, this one's for Neil. Um, Neil, fantastic session on innovation. Um, Thank you for responding to that. Um, it, it is close to my heart. Um, I have tried on a number of occasions to get um, innovation projects off the ground. Some have been successful, some not so. Um, I used to meet a lot of resistance. Um, but one thing I will say is persistence pays. And, and I mentioned right at the beginning, it's not just about ROI. It's how does it fit in? Will it fit our culture? Have we got the people? Um, a lot of the projects, and you mentioned this, it's site-specific or 
um, it comes out of as a, a word, <laughs> spontaneous collaboration. I used to hear that all the time. What does that mean? Um, well, nobody could really explain what it meant. Um, how is it going to help this business is, is what I used to hear mostly. And um, with budgets not being available on site-specific projects, how do you actually get innovation across the line? Now, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you answer that. How, how do we get contractors to do more innovation? I mean, if you look at some contractors, they've got innovation teams, but others haven't. Um, clients mandate certain things to be done, and that's fantastic. You know, if you look at what the government did with BIM, you know, we became the envy of the world on, on that basis. And, and I heard it time and time again. Um, how do we do that? How do we get to be like you? So innovation, how do we make it happen more for contractors? Wow. Um, I just want to point something out about the, uh, the, the BIM thing. Paul, I was listening in um, yesterday about the gig. And I think, yes, y you're right. You know, we, the government mandate turned the dial, but I think it could have been done more effectively. And Paul alluded to how that might happen. So to answer your question, I think I made the point about this sort of decentralized innovation that happens across projects. And in my belief, that's irrational and doesn't really work very well. Evidently, it hasn't worked very well. <clears throat> But you can accept that that's going to happen. I mean, it would be nice to think that organisations are going to change and they'll change that model. But the next best thing to do is to is metrics. I think I alluded to that at the time. So at least join that together in a better way. So if you're not going to centralise your innovation, and some do, centralise your measurement of that innovation. And, and the most compelling cases I've seen is just that simple correlation of inputs to outputs. Remember that measurement costs, right? And that's often an objection. You know, it's going to cost us too much to measure, measure. And sometimes you have this irrational situation where somebody, what's the analogy? Somebody wants to lose weight, but they don't want to use the scales, right? I just want to lose weight. Well, OK, well, where do you start and where do you finish? And some of the traditional measures I was talking about, about AIR, ARR and profitability, still use those. Those are output measures, but correlate those with what's being done, just simple inputs. Now, which projects are innovating? Which ones are simply doing innovation? And then correlate that against their productivity. And sometimes that's enough to raise eyebrows. And then the next thing is to turn that measure into real money. And then use that money realized in the project, recycle it into a central pot, and then start off your innovation and share that across the organization. My final thing to say is, unfortunately, that all boils down to culture. Okay? It has to be set at the top. This, this stupid competitiveness that you get internally, all the only people to blame for that are the people setting policy at the top of the organisation. I'm going to move to the audience. Got a question here. Hi, just want to ask a question which I, I think kind of connects uh, disruptive innovation, well-being and culture change. Um, and it's an open question to anybody. Um, been involved in innovation for many, many years, like a lot of, a lot of you have. Uh, and, and I think that innovation often is, is perceived by the by a person, by a human being, as a threat. You know, you, you're telling me that we're going to do something in a different way. I, I've done it my way, this way all my life. This is undermining me. This is undermining my experience and, and, and so on. That creates anxiety. That creates depression and, and, and so on, and, you know, and, and inhibits culture change. So I, I guess the, the, the question that I'm asking is, how do we make a more compassionate approach towards disruptive technologies in the way that um, helps an individual become a better person and contribute more to or towards the company rather than thinking that maybe they're on the way out the door and, and, and technology is going to replace them. I'll take a stab first. Um, I really think it's most importantly you have to, you know, and, and empower those people that are actually the ones who are going to be the ultimately to drive change in the end. The people that the lowest love are the ones who actually are the doers um, doing it uh, coming up. So I think it's really important for that empowerment of them and then really to his point also making them having those innovation metrics and getting that in front of the people. They have to understand what impact the, this stuff really is to the business and make it help them understand in a way that they're a part of it. Um, because when they think that they're just another number and then the company they're not empowered and part of the innovation, then it's a challenge. But um, it really goes from the, the messaging from the top-down perspective that helps that, but really the other way around from the grassroots up, that they're actually the ones who are going to be the doers kind of making that impact. So it is a challenge when, when, you, when you bring in new technology that's eliminating roles and organizations 
So it's uh, enabling those employees and finding other ways that they can be productive and even if it's something that's eliminating their roles, you know. From a well-being health perspective, it's about leadership and that brings it right back. The, the reality for most people is change is scary, innovation is scary, life is scary. It's for the leader to show people the right way and to get on and do it. Don't, ex don't talk the talk, walk the walk. And it's, it's such a trite phrase, but it's so true. Because when you then look at the compassion piece, and it comes back to that 27% are ill with stress and various other pieces. Don't call it stress, call it distress. In your mind, think of stress as distress. Because stress is actually quite good. Stress drives you. Distress, and all the research shows it, is that negative flick to it. So I would be looking at compassion in change and saying it comes from the top, it comes from intent-based leadership, it comes from mission command, it comes from empowerment. You might want to use the word emancipation because empowerment suggests I've got the power, I've given it to you. Emancipation says you've already got it, get on and use it. Thanks, team. I've got a question from the back here. It's Jerry from Comet. Um, and this is really for you, Andy, um, an observation and a question. Um, many years ago, I was doing a spate of interviews on construction sites, really collaboration to see how teams worked and where things were going wrong. And I hadn't expected, but the level of stress that people were sharing with me was not to do with the job, but to do with the fact they were away from home, perhaps with a young family, and were getting a lot of marital grief. And that was a form of distress. See, I was listening. Distress. And I don't know how you deal with that, because maybe lads on a construction site don't want to share those personal emotions, but it's obviously a huge level of distress with them when they're away from home for a certain time. I don't know how you deal with that. Well, I don't know either. Um, <laughs> no, I think um, it, like that's a good example of the the problem that's uh, around this and, and the culture in, in construction and not actually just construction, uh, many different industries. And um, the, the way that FC Labs look at it is, so those issues that you're talking about, if uh, somebody has, let's say a really positive change in their life as in they've got a baby and they've just asked, they're getting two and a half hours of sleep every night rather than um, their full seven or eight hours. And uh, that will turn up, that could turn up in them causing an accident at work and injuring themselves or injuring others. So uh, from an FC Labs perspective, we just identify that. And then to, we kind of quite often talk about this is, well, that's, the, that's our issue with FC Labs is that we're, yeah, we're just identifying that there's an issue. I think that's a really positive thing because then you get the manager can sit down with the staff member and, and say, your, your trends changed this week compared to the last seven months when you're amazing at your job, something has changed this week and before you have an accident, I want to sit down with you and, and have a conversation. So I think that's a, a positive thing that uh, new technology can, can put in place. However, it potentially points to the fact that we need to, it's not just one technology is, is going to be the game changer, it's how they all interact with each other. It's things like Cindy then and, and making other technologies available so that there's a there's a path that the employee knows that they can they can follow and they can be as vocal about it as they want or if they want to keep it internally then these things are available to them to improve without having to have that awkward conversation That's my thanks very much now we have 15 minutes left of q a so we've got one more question at the back and i'll come to you at the front here Hi, Max from Comet. Um, the question's not actually from myself, it's from our engaged online audience. So uh, thank you for still attending, even if you couldn't make it here in person with the, uh, the Michigoss that's going on with public transport at the moment. Um, the questions are mainly centered around innovation and there's a lot of couple, there's a couple of different questions around how you innovate. But I think I'm going to group them together and I, I, I'd like each of the speakers just to give 30 seconds on this. Obviously, we talked about the need for innovation and the lack of innovation. And yeah, I saw Neil's eyebrows go straight up there. He and I have discussed this at length. So there are programs out there. Innovate 18 is part of Crossrail that became I3P as a national body. How do you 
foster innovation with your own, your own businesses? And if you don't currently, what steps are you going to take away from what you've seen here today to foster innovation? So we'll just go along the line from left to right, if that's OK. Excuse me, I'm on the left, and I was on my right. Um, so um, I engage with people. So I am a, uh, uh, an innovator, and I'd say that I'm a disruptive innovator in what we're applying to a very old traditional space that is uh, owned by the big five companies. Um, and um, what I do as an innovator is that I don't hide my innovations I share my innovations. I engage with conversation. I know as an innovator that actually 99% of people are not innovators, but they've got a really good opinion and they can give a really good customer perspective of it. Um, I engage with my customers before I engage with my trade customers. I want to know what my users, individual customers think of my product because I want the true feedback from them before I go to their aggregator, their, tr their, their, their buyer, because he'll never tell me what's good or bad. He'll just beat me up over the price or whatever it is. So I think it's, it's, it's about asking the right questions, being open to sharing the thoughts and innovation and, and getting yourselves into a network where that can flow. Because as we've said, the, the, large, the leading companies don't want to innovate. They want to hold on to what they've got. They don't want to share anything. Um, and so it takes, it takes, you know, all you've got to do is read those lovely books from that, I can't remember what the guy's name, the disruptor. When he goes on about how Toyota demolished GM and how all the other, how disruption takes place, that is how innovation, I think, happens in the 21st century. This kind of question is going to get harder to answer the further we, we go around, so I'm really glad I'm just second. Um, I, yet, it was something I was thinking about earlier on, and it follows on from what you were saying. I, I was just thinking that we need to shout about it, shout about great innovation and uh, celebrate. If, if anybody looks back over what you've done over the last 12 months and what your company has done, guaranteed there will be some great innovations that individuals or groups have, have driven. and. UK in general, uh, British people are not great at shouting about uh, their, their innovations. Other countries, some of them, some of them really are. And I think to recognise what you, yeah, there's loads of challenges we, that we've identified, but guaranteed there's some great innovations, and we need to shout about it and share it as well. Uh, get it out on social media, and you'll inspire the other people that are in your company. I'm not sure I could say it better than Paul did, but I'll just build on it if I may. Engagement, absolutely right. But I think you've got to make it safe for people in your organisation to bring ideas forward. And not only that, not only you know, putting your ideas in an idea box, but that it matters, that, that it's being listened to. Some of the best ideas I've heard in my career come from the point of activity worker. The person who's doing their job is the best person to ask. And how many people I encounter are com feel completely disenfranchised and are that and therefore ignored. Another thing I just build on what you said, Paul, is that you know sometimes people aren't extroverts; they, they're not willing to come forward, which I think was the point that you made. So again, make it safe for them to have a voice. You know, spend that time engaging with them. Um, and as I said, I, I couldn't make that argument any better than you made it, Paul. And it's now starting to get more tricky. So, for me, <coughs> invention is not innovation, and don't mix the two up. So that's the first thing that we do at IOM. We make it very clear that innovation is seeing what others have done and applying it to our context so that we can do our stuff better. We don't have to reinvent a wheel. We just have to improve the wheel for our perspective. The second bit, and it absolutely chimes with that, give it to the person who's got the problem. Do not expect the top to be this brain of great ideas because it's rubbish. I'm really, really fortunate. I have a bunch of very clever people who've got more letters after their name than I will ever actually be able to write. So I have that luxury, luxurious position of being able to say to them, you have the empowerment. You, have, you are free to make those decisions and do stuff. And I think the final piece that we do is we have an absolute acceptance of failure. We like to fail fast and fail cheap, 
but the acceptance, if you don't do it, you'll never know. Really hard for a bunch of scientists who just love to have a perfect answer before they'll commit to anything. But that's where we kind of go. So it's all for me about don't worry about invention because it doesn't have to happen and learn from everybody else. Thank you. Definitely getting harder now. Um, I suppose my easy way of talking about this, we, I'm quite fortunate for, the, for the, the company I work with. It was born out of innovation. Roger, who started our company, who still owns and runs our company, saw the need for more innovation in a very competitive access market to make lower weight, more lighter solutions. Um, he could have built the same as what everyone else is doing, um, but that's what everyone else is doing. So there would have been no real business, re real need to start that business. He still works for us. He's still enshrined in our company. He still comes in every day. So that's his top-down leadership on innovation on our side. Um, but it, it stems all the way through our engineering departments, our recruitment into engineers. Uh, I know one particular one we run, a re not to talk just too much about our company, we run a very um, appealing uh, post-grad project where we, we take graduates in. We then offer them, I think, to pay for their last year. We'll pay for their masters, providing they do this, that, and the other. But also, at the same point, we, we lure them in with the fact that you're not just going to be designing nuts and bolts or drawing light bulbs for a big, massive company. You'll be designing the next product, the next innovation that's going to go on our products. And we can start that off from a young age. I think the average age in our engineering office is, is not old at all. Um, but then that's, that has fallen down through to our manufacturing and our production. Um, we do something quarterly called the Innovation Awards, where it's actually an online app that we have in the business that anyone from the chairman all the way down to any uh, stores, the guys out in the yard, if they can see a way of doing something better, whether it's a cost saving, something more efficient, whether they just have a really good idea, they can supply that, they put that in, no ideas deemed bad, and then there is a scaling of rewards. Um, it was interesting because it didn't have that much traction, and I did steal, a, well, stole the idea from the military from the GEM suggestion that they have in there, so we started offering financial incentives, um, like just random things like even gift vouchers and parking spaces, but it was engaging people on all levels. So that, that's how we do it. Um, I would say the first thing you ask and look at your organization, are you investing in, in innovation and whether that's technology or the people and one of my first roles shift out of uh, an actual construction role as field engineer and quality was business, business excellence manager. I'll never forget talking to the president. And I was telling him, hey, I want to implement and talk about lean methodologies. And he's, he's sitting there looking at me in construction like, is this weird? And, uh, um, and, and long story short, um, I th you, have to inv you have to have a leader in innovation in your organization, understanding that they need to help drive it down and, and, and promote an innovative culture and by means of many ways of empowering your employees offering portals to enter it, offering workshops in order to gather that innovation ideas. Some people don't like to speak up, some people don't. You know, mix of generations of people that are coming in, some younger, younger, um, agile, you're really excited, but you also need to blend that with the tribal knowledge of the, of the later, uh, so it can't be one. So looking at your teams and making sure that they have the, really the right mix of, of people within that team that are gonna um, promote good ideas, but I really think it's a combination of are you investing it? Um, someone has got to be a leader in driving it um, and then uh, create many means of getting the ideas and empowering the people um, to really drive it down. Thank you. I agree with all the comments we've heard so far. I think one of the things we've got here with Comet, we've got a great forum, we've got a great platform. I would say get involved in some of the projects. We've got some great projects going on. Uh, we, we can make a difference here. And, and, and to Neil's point earlier around, we are seeing innovation every single day on our construction projects. What we're not doing is not capturing it and we're not measuring it, we're not recording it and we're not sharing it. Uh, not even nearly enough. And absolutely agree with the culture of innovation and you've got to have somebody supporting it from the top. So, the hardest of all. <laughs> Well, actually, not really. Um, I'm just going to share some quickly an anecdotal evidence on a project early on in my career. And this was a road project with several structures on it, one very big structure. <clears throat> and the project manager said to me, get in the car, we're going for a ride. I said, what, lunch? He said, no, we're going to go and see somebody. It was almost like um, see a man about a dog, but it was see a man about a bridge. And even though we had temporary works designs, we had temporary works designers, um, the, 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 the award in the project was based on a, uh, on, a, on, a, on a bid and in the bid details was how to build this bridge. And he said, forget all that, it's in the back of the Land Rover. 
okay, and what we're going to do? He said, we're going to talk to the man who's going to build it. And <clears throat> very quickly, I learned a lesson that if we could save the money by doing it slightly differently, or save some money by doing it slightly differently, we're being innovative. And it was great, because if you'd looked at the original plans on how to do this, it was really complex, very complex. In fact, the shutters that were in some part of the bridge, you would never remove afterwards. So it had not really been thought out properly. So anyway, long story short, the guy that was in charge of it came up with a saving, well, a mechanism to basically save weeks or months off the program and save a fortune in temporary works costs. Now, that was my first foray into innovation. And it was only through collaboration, and, and, and as it's been mentioned, involving people at the coal face, we, we contributed to finishing early. The safety standing, we couldn't really say, but there was zero incidents or accidents on the particular um, part of the site. But to me, that was, it was set in stone from there on. There's opportunities to save everywhere all at once. And, and coming back to what Commit is, um, it's been mentioned a few times, we're a collaboration platform. We bring people together. Not one person has got all the answers, but collectively, we might have. We've got projects. The lifeblood of Commit is projects. We've got two excellent projects. People sat here involved in the projects. Some great things going on. We've got six more projects that we could actually, well, do some even greater things. So let's have you guys involved. So thank you. Thanks, panel. We have one final question before we break for lunch. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Graham Neller from Screening Eagle Technologies. This is a question for Nathan, uh, but please welcome any other contributions. Uh, starting with tools that we have now, such as carbon calculators used in BIM, we're able to work out the embodied carbon and present that data potentially at the strategic definition stage. Could we do the same with the health and safety data that you have, present to the clients? This is what the workforce would be exposed to if you go down the recycle and uh, circular economy route compared to destruct and rebuild again. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a great example of the volume of data across a whole spectrum of stuff absolutely can help tell the story. The real issue is that often the client, whoever that may be, is not really interested in listening because health's not important, safety is important, and that could be a tick box requirement at one end, or it could be that they just want a really low AFR and an ARR and they don't want any riddles. There's no riddle for cancer in the same way because, oh, it takes too long to prove. But the answer is yes. We did some work with HS2, um, and they now quote the number back to us. We did about a year ago. 24,000 people at the time were working on HS2. We could prove that by the work that they were doing today, that 1,000 people on HS2 would get long-term ill health that would result in death, most likely, just by working on that site in the way that they were working today just to prompt the thought. But the answer is the data is absolutely there. We would love to have a conversation as to how we might get that kind of project running because quite frankly, we're getting a bit fed up of hearing the same thing that says health's not important and it absolutely is. Uh, on that as well, there is another example which we ran out of time in the presentation to talk about, but I thought it was a brilliant example. It might have even been IOM that was involved. There was a large company that was uh, approached to do a, a big project in the outskirts of London. Uh, they used the data available and they ran the numbers and it told them that if they took on this project without changing any of their procedures, they would pretty much guaranteed kill six members of staff with the current practices that UK construction uses. So they said, we, we, can't, we can't do the project. Uh, they then uh, worked with the, uh, the person looking to get the project done. They changed some of the procedures so they could bring that down to potentially zero deaths, which, which is kind of ridiculous that we even have a construction industry in the UK that you have that data now that tells you we can kill six people doing this project. Um, there's lots of innovations that they put into practice, which is amazing. Uh, one of the kind of most hard hitting and actually simplest things is, is not using technology. They use that data, which is brilliant. It shows the power of data. Uh, every pro um, project manager on that construction site there on day one of their training, they need to do role play and they need to pretend that uh, they are approaching somebody of their member, uh, of their team members, uh, their team members 
husband, wife, uh, family, and telling them that their uh, husband or wife passed away on their construction site today and, and worked through that role play to, to really bring it home. I thought that was a really nice way of using data and technology, but also feeding it into the, the human factor at the end of the day. Just to add to that, we've got most of the processes and policies in place for that low hanging fruit, as we alluded to before. We've just got to kind of enforce it. And when you look at it, 85% of the accidents that occur on in construction, in fact, across what the HSCC, across almost all industries, it's down to people. It's down to the fact that they have failed to behave properly. But it's about giving that data, giving that insight to the leadership to provide the culture that enables us to do the right thing. We don't need to cut corners. We need to leverage technology to do the stuff better. Uh, and that's where I do the plea for commit because I'm massively up for it because the reality is data's there, let's use it. Couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you very much, everybody. It's been a wonderful discussion this morning. I hope you all agree that, and thank you to the speakers for, our, for your candor. It's been uh, thought provoking. So we're now breaking for lunch um, and I think we are coming back. Let me just check the, oh. Oh, lunch is sponsored, kindly sponsored by Vantage UAV. Um, I think we're having an hour for lunch. Is that right, Stuart? So back reconvening at one o'clock. Thank you very much, all.